for everlasting. To everlasting Lord. You are the mighty God. Creator of all things. Mighty. Majesty. Holiness. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. Kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations.
grateful that you are here with us this morning but really Lord we are grateful that you've brought us here to be with you and father in your infinite wisdom 
your knowledge and your understanding, God. You know what we need to hear this morning, Lord. And Father, so we pray that you would make us hungry for the word of God. That you would teach us, Lord, instruct us, Lord, in the ways that you would have us to go and what you would have us to do, Lord God. Father, we are but finite men. And Father, we get lost real easy. So direct us this morning, Lord God, by the Spirit of God and by the Word of God. And we open ourselves to you, God. We yield ourselves to you, Lord. Go beyond our mind today, Lord, and our thinking, and go straight to our heart, Lord God. Now glorify yourself, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. This morning, if you brought your Bibles with you, and hopefully you did, if not, you better get on your phone real quickly, not to talk. We are in the book of Luke, chapter 5, verse 12 through 26. Luke, chapter 5, verse 12 through 26. It says, And it happened when he was in a certain city that behold a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and he touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal him, or heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and to lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up in the to on the housetop and left him down with his bed, or led him down th with his bed through the tiling into the mist before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and he said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose up before them, took up what he had been laying on and departed to his own house glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear saying, we have seen strange things today. I have a question I want to ask each one. You have to think this time. When you come to church, God doesn't want you to leave your brain outside. But he does want you to think with your heart, too. If God was to say to you this morning, I'm going to give you the opportunity to live in any time of history you choose. I'm going to allow you, because I thought about this myself, what, what time I would like to live in. 
And I thought about this. I thought, okay, I don't have a problem with that, but I want to take my children with me, my grandchildren, and take people in the church, and then I'm okay. So what would be the time that you would pick? Would it be the Roman time in Caesar Augustus? Or would it be in the time of Moses' time or Noah's time? I wouldn't want to live in those times. The thing is, someone said, we already do live in those times, Noah's time. And that's true, possibly, for sure. But I would like to live during that time of when Jesus, for three years of ministry, I would like to have lived during that time when Jesus rose people, Lazarus, from the dead. I'd like to have seen that. I would like to have lived during the time when Jesus said, eyes be open, and the eyes were open for the first time ever this man had never seen before. I would like to be during that time when Jesus would say, cast out a demon, who, a man who was possessed by 1,000 demons is totally set free. That's the time I would like to live. And these are the times that we're going to talk about concerning the great miracles that Jesus did. Things that with man is impossible. But I want you to think about this. Because when we read miracles that Jesus did, a lot of times we think, well, those were past. Those things, same things don't happen anymore. Here's what the Bible teaches. That God is the same today, yesterday, and what's the last word? Forever. God never changes. Let me ask you this question. Many times when we, I drive through these, this town, I see people that are strange. Sometimes when I come to church, I, no. <laughs> when I look in the mirror, sometimes, no. My point is, is this. I have no doubt that I see people that are possessed at times, without a doubt. There are some people that have mental illness, without a doubt, it's true. But I believe that there are those same things that we confront and that God still deals and heals and still does miraculous things. I've seen God do healing from cancer. I've seen him change hearts. I've seen God do miraculous things. And many times when we read scriptures like this, we see God do something wonderful. We think, well, that's great. I really like that story. That's awesome. It's just a good thing to think about. But we can miss that healing are that supernatural thing that God wants to do within us because we only think it was for them then. And it's not true. In fact, the Bible teaches us when somebody gets sick to call for the elders and to anoint them with oil and God and the prayer of faith will heal those people that are sick. You see, many times, as we will see, we limit God by our faith in God. Let me say this to you before we go into the study because we're going to see some miraculous things that God's, God does there or Jesus does. And that is this. Every time we gather together, I expect from God something. Every time I go to the Word of God, I expect something from God. Every time I go to prayer, I want to hear from God. And many times God speaks to me, but He brings the Word of God back into remembrance. That's what He does. But many times, if a person doesn't expect from God, they don't get from God. And it isn't because God isn't giving. It's that their hearts is not in the place of receiving what God has. God wants you to expect every time you go to Him, every time you go to prayer, every time you go to the Word of God, every time you go to God's house, God wants you to expect. That way God can do something. That way you are open to receive from God. So let's go to our story now. But this is an awesome story, and it'll change your heart and open your eyes today, without a doubt, if you'll let it. Jesus' ministry is young. He has just started doing miraculous things. He started doing ministry. And he's doing great things. The last week we learned that the miracle that he did, that he told Peter. He got in the boat and said, Peter, throw out your nets. And this is what Peter said. Lord, I've been fishing all night. I'm a fisherman. You're just a good teacher. 
But he says, because, okay, God, you tell me, Jesus, I'll do it. And he threw out his net and he caught more fish than he's ever caught in the history of fishing. And the scripture says, this is what Peter said to Jesus when he brought all the fishing. Lord, don't look at me. I'm a sinful man. And the Bible says that in this story, that Peter, James, and John leave everything. Leave everything and begin to follow Christ. They leave their success or leave their fishing. And I shared with you last week that it's so important that we recognize that we do leave things, that we put God first, and everything else becomes second, whether it be a wife, whether it be children, whether it be work, whatever it may be, that they need to be second after Christ, and everything will fall into place where God wants it to be, and God will bless it. This is what these men did. But now we begin to see something a little bit different. Jesus begins to walk amongst people. Jesus was always amongst people, and he does something miraculous. He runs into a person who has a serious problem. And I know in the sense of how he feels as a leper. Let's go to the very first verse. Verse 12. And it happened when he was in a certain city. That behold a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and he implored him saying, Lord... If you are willing, you can make me clean. I want to share with you a little thing about this, little thoughts and ideas and truths about this thing called leprosy. It is the most offensive, annoying, dangerous, contentious disease, the virus of which generally pervades the whole body. It was common in Egypt and is still common in Egypt today and in the East. I want you to notice something that the scripture teaches here. It says that his body was full of leprosy. Now that might not seem important to you, that word full. But it means that he had it all over his whole body. In other words, he is in the last stages of leprosy. It is eaten every part. How many have ever had poison oak? Raise your hand. How many have ever had it all over their body? Raise your hand. It is horrible, isn't it? Here's what you do. You lay in your bed, because I had it too, the same thing. My eyes were puffed up, my ears, everything was puffed up. You got to just lay there with no clothes on, or a pair of underwear. <laughs> Don't picture that, but... <laughs> That's what you're doing, and you can't do anything, and here's what you want to do. This is what you want to do, and there are times you do that. I've done it. But everything itches you. Your toe, everything itches you. Leprosy eats everything in your body. Imagine having your whole body full of leprosy. You are at the end of your life, so to say. You're getting ready to die. That's where you are. This man, with this leprosy, is consumed. And so what does he do? He goes to this person named Jesus. Now, when we look at leprosy, a lot of times we think of it, well, the guy was lepers, okay, what's the big deal? Leprosy had different things that caused things to happen in your life that were not the same. In our society today, if you get a disease, if you get AIDS, if you get any kind of those diseases, they don't quarantine you in any way. Because they think it's against your rights. But really, when it's something that's contagious, or you can catch it from somebody else, whether, whatever way it may be, it comes against those who don't have its rights. In these days, if a man caught leprosy or had leprosy, Literally, that man was ostracized from every single person that was alive. So let me give you an example. If I was to catch leprosy, I could no longer be with my wife in any kind of relationship. I could not be in the home anymore. 
I could never be with my children or my grandchildren. I could never be with you as a church because you, were, you could never go to the temple. You could never go to the house of God. You could never have any relationship. And let me tell you this, okay? I'd have a serious problem with this. Because first of all, I'm a touchy guy when it comes to my wife, my children, my grandchildren, and even Christians. I like hugging and especially kissing my wife and my sons, my grandkids. I'm a touchy person. You may not be. You say, well, well that's not going to bother me. Trust me, it'll bother you. This man could not touch anybody, could not have any, any kind of contact and everything. So it takes years. So this man has had this for years. It would be so horrific to have this kind of a disease and sickness. But, and this man had it. So I want to go further with this man. Because we only see that, but I want to see more, more part. He, I'm sure he would, after years, he was depressed. He was discouraged and he was hopeless. He, he probably thought, life is so horrific. I don't know why, I'm existing. And he probably thought, I don't want to live no more. It ain't worth it. Now, I say all this with this thought also in mind. Sin is a type of leprosy. And as this man was restricted, so sin does the exact same thing to us. When we decide that we're going to do something, we don't see the effects that sin does. But it does affect us. It does do something to us. We don't move the same. We don't act the same. It does a work within us. Now, there are, as we will see, a great possibility that this man's sin is what caused him to have leprosy. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was leprosy, I mean, that he got leprosy because of sin, but it is a possibility that sin caused him leprosy. You see, sin causes us to be separate from God. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that God doesn't care about us. It doesn't mean that God's not working. It means that it does some damage to us. It restricts us. So this man is at this place. The scripture teaches many places in the book of Leviticus how to deal with this. Now it says here that this man fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. This man comes to Jesus, and I personally believe he has seen something happen miraculously. This man had to be up in the mountains, and he could look down, and he could see things. He could never be with people, but he could look and see what was happening. I believe that this man did this. He followed, and he watched Jesus down the road, and he kept on looking. He seen him heal. He seen people being set free from demons. So he kept on looking and looking and looking, and he said this to himself. If Jesus can do that for these people, he can do this for me. And so he followed, and that's when he came and decided that, you know what? I'm going to go to Jesus, but I want you to know this position he came. Because there are other people who came to Jesus, and they said, you know what? You need to heal me. Now, I know that you as a Christian would never go to God and get upset with him and say, you know what? I don't want this no more. You need to do something about this, God. There are people who are mad at God. Can you believe that? I cannot believe that. I'm sorry, but I can't. But they come to God this way, but this man comes and prostrates himself, the scripture says, literally lays himself before God, and he humbles himself before God. I think possibly in his heart and in his mind, he thinks, I deserve to have this leprosy, but I don't want to have it. I've done things that are contrary to the truth of God, and I know what I should do. I want to say this. God gave the commandments 
to his people and he said if you will do these I will bless you and I will bless your life but if you don't do these things this is going to happen your life is going to be cursed now when Jesus comes he has thousands and thousands and thousands if not millions of people who are either sick demon possessed have horrible things going on with them why is that? because they have not followed the word of God in their lives that's why so he goes and he humbles himself brings himself to God and he implores him the word literally means that he begs Jesus to heal him he prays so to say there's a few other scriptures that the Bible teaches about concerning the same thing about petitioning or praying and asking God and I want you to get this point, and that is this. When things in our life are going hard, or things are happening, or we get sick, or whatever it may be, the first thing you need to do is go to God. Listen to what Luke 17, 13 says. And they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. You'll see that through all the New Testament when people came asking for healing. Psalm 50 verse 5 call upon me in the day of trouble I don't want you to raise your hand but how many of you feel like you're in trouble this morning whatever it may be trials or testing or whatever it may be poison oak that's trouble call on me when you're in trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me Psalm 91 15 you shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble I will deliver him and honor him I cannot tell you how important it is to go to God when things start getting hard or things are to happen you don't understand. Our sickness. Notice what the next part of this verse says. If, and this man is asking, really, because he doesn't know, concerning his own situation, if you are willing, let me read the word to you in the original Greek. Do you have this in mind, God? This is what he's asking. Is this your intent? To resolve or determine, is this your purpose? Do you desire to do this, God? Or do you take delight and pleasure in this, God? With this man, it is not a question of whether Jesus can heal, but a question of whether he is willing to heal at this point. Just a short reminder for all of us. The purpose of prayer is never to accomplish my will. Except as my will has been molded and shaped, conformed to God's will. Always the purpose of prayer, the thrust of prayer is the will of God. The accomplishing of the will of God upon the earth. And we need to remember that Jesus said, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thy will is. This is what God desires for us when we come. Let me tell you what my prayer is at the very beginning. I say this, God, I'm going to pray and I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to petition and I'm going to suffocate. And usually my prayers are, I want to know you better. I want to love you. I want to walk with you deeper. But Lord, as I pray, I want to pray your will. So whatever I pray, please make it your will. And if you decide to change that, I'm okay with that. I've learned in praying as long as I've been a Christian that I do want God's will no matter what it is. Now I want you to go further in the next verse it says you can make me clean. You are able. He knows for sure that he can make him clean or cure him. I believe personally that Jesus has the ability to heal every and any sickness, disease, or anything caused by the fall of mankind. I don't care what it is. But I also believe that there is a thing called the sovereignty of God. And many of us have a problem with that. That means that it is God's choice of whether he will heal the person or not. So what is God's criteria concerning 
who he heals and who he doesn't heal. It's really very simple if I will accept it. Is it the perfect will of God? Number one. Number two, is this the perfect will for my personal life? And number three, is it what's best for me concerning eternity? You see, there was a man named Paul who loved God. He's the one that wrote most of the books in the New Testament. He came to God one day and he said, God, I don't want to be sick no more. I don't want this sickness. And he didn't get an answer from God. But then he went a second time to God and he said, God, I don't want this no more. I don't want to be sick. He didn't hear anything from God, so he went a third time and he said, God, I don't want to be sick no more. I don't want this sickness. I want you to heal me. And God said to Paul, I'm not going to heal you, Paul. And let me tell you what Paul could have thought. Here I am, been serving you. For 30 some years, I've committed my life 24 7 to you. And I ask for one little thing, God, that's hindering me. And you say no to me? But God didn't stop there when he was speaking to Paul. He continued to speak to Paul and he said this to him Paul, I'm going to let this stake this sickness stay in your body you don't understand but now I'm going to explain to you why this sickness is going to stay in your body because I've given you so much revelation concerning me you know me like not many men know me so in order for that to keep you humble and keep you in a place of usability I have to keep you and allow you to, this to happen in your body and then God went on and says this to him. Because Paul, when you are weak, then I am strong in you. And Paul said this, Okay, Lord, no problem. I'll never ask again. But God went on further and he said this, Paul, I'm not going to heal you, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour my grace upon your life in this area. And that's going to be, make you fully sufficient you're not going to need anything. You're going to be okay with this. You see, God makes a promise that when he doesn't heal, he pours your, his grace upon your life in what you need. It is important that we understand that. God is not going to heal everything. God looks, please listen, at your life for eternity. I'm going to say this to you. I'm going to get personal with my own, concerning my own self. You might look at somebody, you might think, you know what? They got everything perfect in their life. Everything's going just the way it should go. There are many things in people's lives that they are going the right way. It doesn't mean that God doesn't allow certain things. There's a stake that God has allowed in my own personal flesh that I've asked God to heal. And God says, no, he's not going to heal it. And let me tell you what he said. The exact same thing he said to Paul. I'm no Paul. That's not what I'm saying in any way. But I am saying that God has said that his grace would be sufficient for me. And let me tell you this. God looks at things eternity. The same thing with you. Please listen. He says the same thing to you. God looks at things for eternity. And he says, I have to allow this to stay there for now. Eternity God looks at, not this life. I don't know if I can put up with this much longer, Pastor. I feel like that leper. You know, and God says, you'll be okay. I'll pour my grace on you. You'll be okay. And he may, God may want to heal you. I'm not saying he doesn't. But we must remember the sovereignty of God. And there are other things that God without a doubt will heal in you. If you ask God to heal your heart, God says, I'll heal your heart. You see, many of us have been wounded as we grew up. Or we were neglected from our parents or whatever it may be. We all come from dysfunctionalism. 
There's not one of you, I don't care how great everything was in your life, who did not have some dysfunctionalism happen. Our hearts will be healed by God whenever we ask Him. And let me tell you what else God uses to heal our hearts. Please listen. The Word of God. If I need my marriage to be healed, God says, here's the Word of God. Apply it and live it. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to be healed in my marriage on my part. Well, uh, you know, he's not doing I'm not doing it. Forget you, dude. Okay. Then don't blame God. Well, I thought this was going to be so wonderful. Well, have you been applying the Word of God to it like you're supposed to that will heal that area that needs to be healed? Well, kind of. Then it, your kind of got healed. <laughs> so, if God through His sovereignty has decided not to heal you, God promises to pour His grace on you. Now, there are examples in the scripture that teach about people who had leprosy because of their sin. I want to read a couple stories to you because I think it's important. Numbers 12, 11, and 12 says this. And when the clouds departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. Then Aaron turned toward Miriam, and there she was, a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us in which we have done foolishly and which we have sinned. Please do not let her be as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's room. So we see Miriam and, Mo and Aaron. They talked about Moses. They were gossiping about leadership. Oh, he thinks he's so hot. I'm just as hot as he is with God and she caught leprosy and God heals her after seven days there's another story in the book of 2nd Chronicles chapter 26 then Uzziah became furious and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense and while he was angry with the priest leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord besides the incense altar and Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him there on his forehead and he was leprous but they thrust him out of the place. Indeed, he was also hurried to get out because the Lord struck him. Now, I want to sh share this a little on this story, real shortly. Uzziah was a good man. He was a man that loved God. He walked with God. And God blessed him. He served Judah as king for 55 years. And the God Bible says he was a great king, a godly king. But what happened to him is this. He started getting to a place of where he thought you know God's blessed me I got it all together and all of a sudden the Bible says he got full of pride and he went into a position of the place of where only the priest was to be he overstepped his bounds and literally as he's in there where the priest should be leprosy breaks out on him now he ends up not repenting. He ends up not going to God because I believe that God would have healed him because he loved God. But he began, began to get bitter, began to get angry at God. And so he ends up dying and his son takes, takes over. But he ends up dying with, with, with leprosy. Real quickly, pride is something that will destroy us. You always, and please listen, always have to be aware of pride I like what someone said I don't know who said it but I like it humbleness or humility should be our best friend and pride should be our greatest enemy and it's true more people have fallen away from God and into sin because of pride Whenever I think I know more than what God knows concerning the Word of God, when I know the Word of God tells me, don't go there, don't do that, I can handle it, God. I'm in trouble. Now, then he put his hand, verse 13, and he touched him saying, I am willing. And he cleansed him. Immediately the leprosy left him. 
I look at this story and to me it's a miraculous thing that God does. I want you to put yourself in this guy's place. You've been separated from your family and the people you love. You've been separated from society. You cannot go to church anymore. And some people might say, oh, that might be a good thing. My point is, you're all alone. And now all of a sudden, you're healed. All of a sudden, the leprosy is out of your body. You're completely normal. Your skin is just like a baby's skin, brand new. Now you think you can go back to society. No, you can't. Have you ever seen somebody that's been out there and they no longer drink, they no longer take drugs, they no longer do any of those things, and you see them after they stop for about two months, what do you do? I can't believe that guy, that guy's a drunk, man. He's an alcoholic. Stay away from him, he does drugs. You think about kids when you were in high school, and what do you remember about those kids if you, don't, you haven't seen them for 40 years? Yeah, he was a jerk in high school. He's still the same way. My point is, this man could not go back into society. He had to follow the law. The Bible talks about the law. He had to go and do an offering. He had to go to the priest and be inspected and everything else. And that took a period of time. And after he was all inspected and everything else, and they accepted him from the priesthood, then he could go back into society somewhat. And it would take a time, a period of time, for him to go back to somewhat normal. But I can't, you can't imagine the excitement that he had concerning seeing his wife, if his wife's still alive, or his children, or his grandchildren, and embracing them, love them, and the weeping of joy that this man would experience. Now, I have a scripture, it's in Genesis 18, 14, it says this, is there anything too hard for the Lord? At that time appointed, I will return unto thee, and according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. I read that with this in mind. Sometimes we look at people and we think, you know what, they're throwaways. They're throwaways. God could never change that person. God could never do anything miraculous. Let me say this. Please look and listen. You were one of those people. Somebody thought that about you. When I first became a Christian, people looked at me and said, you're a Christian. I still have things people tell me. Well, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> My point is, is this. With God, there's no throwaways. With God, God can change a heart which will change a life. God can heal the inside of anybody as long as they're willing. And that's a fact. I say this to you, don't disregard anybody. Because God doesn't disregard anybody. And God didn't disregard you. No. Jesus speaks to him and he says, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to those as of Moses. However, the report went around concerning him as of the more, and the great multitude came together and to hear him and to be healed by him of their infirmity. So Jesus is growing. Many people are coming and he's healing everyone. And Jesus decides he's going to withdraw for a moment. My second point. Things were getting crazy around Jesus. Great multitudes of people were showing up and expecting him to heal them and to teach them. Jesus needed to unplug for the pressures and constant input from people to pray for and he needed to be recharged. Beloved, we live in a world of information overload. Have you noticed? It has changed the way we interact with each other. We can get so caught up in our electronic devices that we don't even have a decent meal together. Our business information 
film lives not only affect our families and our relationships, but it affects our connection with God. Jesus felt the need to disconnect from the world and pray. So should we. I cannot tell you how important this point is. The family is disintegrating. And part of the reason is men, spiritual leaders, are not unplugging themselves from the things that are going on and going in the mountains, so to say, which could be their room or their closet, and spending time with God. I cannot tell you how important it is. And I beg you in Jesus' name not to use the excuse, I don't have time. If Jesus, being thronged by people, 24-7, decided, and we see it all over the New Testament where Jesus went and unplugged himself and went and spent time with God the Father to get wisdom and counsel, how to direct and what to do, how much more do we need it? But pastor, I don't have time. I got a busy schedule. You better get unbusy. Because the times we live, we need more wisdom and counsel from God than we ever have. And God desires to speak to us. God desires to direct us. But I have to give God that time. And I'm not talking about, okay, God, give me the Amen. I covered all my family. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm not saying don't cover your family. Now, Jesus forgives and heals a paralytic. We'll go quickly through this one. Now, it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there was a Pharisee and the teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal. So we see this group that there's a lot of people that want to be healed and the power was present to heal. But I want you to notice who else has joined the group now. These are religious people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These are men, Pharisees. You had to memorize the whole first five books of the law. And another Pharisee could come up to you if you were a Pharisee and say, what does Exodus 21 verse 6 say you had to say that and quote it per word for word if not you will be removed as a Pharisee that's pretty heavy isn't it they were really religious but they didn't come to hear about God they came to criticize they came to see what's, what is wrong that's being said now we have to be careful ourselves as critical spirits When I first got saved, first became born again, we sang hymnal songs. And I thought to myself, these are wonderful. And for the whole time that I was, all there was was hymnals mainly, I worshiped God. I cried and my, the Lord touched me with these hymnals, Amazing Grace. Oh, that's a great song, Pastor. But there were a lot of others that weren't that great either in the sense of they touched my heart because my heart was in the right place. I wasn't critical. And we can come to church and come to God's house and miss out just like these Pharisees did the Messiah and the presence of God and the talking of God and the word of God because you know what? We're critical. Well, I didn't like the way the pastor said he didn't have very good vocabulary this morning. Boy, if you missed out what God is saying this morning because of my vocabulary, you're in a bad place. God is the one who speaks. We need to not be critical. There's no perfection yet, beloved, until we get to heaven. There's no perfection until we get to heaven. Then we'll all be perfect. We're to see through each other through the eyes of grace and mercy and compassion. And more than anything else, love. God's great love. But these men will miss it. He'll miss Jesus because they're critical. Verse 18, Then behold, men brought on a bed of man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in, and they lay before him. And when they had come, they could not find him. And they brought to him because of the crowd. Then they went up in the roof 
and they let him down in the bed through the tiling in the mist before Jesus. So these men brought somebody, went and picked him up, a friend, and they had either seen Jesus heal, they had seen miraculous things, and they wanted their friend to be healed. But when they got to the house, the house was completely full and they couldn't get in. So what they did is they said, we'll fix that. We'll go up on the roof and we'll start pulling the roof down and we'll lower him down so he can be healed. Now these are the kind of friends you like. These are the kind of friends you want. Now let's go further. These are the kind of friends you got to be. Here's what it says in the book of Proverbs. If you want a friend, here's what it says. You remember what it says, the rest of it? Tell me. Be a friend. Friendship is lost now, beloved. I'm going to go on before I get on that one. <laughs> Verse 20. When he saw their faith, this is Jesus, he said to them, Men, your sins are forgiven you. So it says here, literally, Jesus saw the faith of these four men. It wasn't the faith of this man at this point. But he saw the faith of the other people. Did you know that you, your faith can be seen? People say, well, you can't see my faith. Yes, I can. Listen to what the book of James says. Verse chapter, chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he had faith, but he does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to him, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What is the profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And here's a clincher, and I will show you my faith by my works. So our faith can be seen by what we do concerning God and His Word. I want you to also remember this. This man is going to, his faith is going to be tested too. Because Jesus is going to tell him this. Get up and walk. You see, the four men brought him, they had faith that God was going to heal them. But there was another man who was brought. His faith was tested. Let me ask you this question. When God tells you to do something concerning the Word of God, you have a choice of whether you're going to apply that to your life and it has the possibility of healing you or not healing you. This man took Jesus' word. He said, get up and walk. Take your mat. This man picked up his mat, stood up, walked off, and went on his road and was healed. There are many times that God's going to say the exact same thing to you concerning your life. He's going to tell you the word of God. And what you do with it can either cause you to be healed or not be healed. So when God says something, we need to listen. Verse 21, then the scribe and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sin but God alone? And they're saying, what they're saying is true. For God is the only one who can forgive sin. What they were missing is they didn't realize or see that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Verse 22, when Jesus perceived their thoughts. This is a real heavy one, beloved. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and he said to them, Why are you reasoning in your heart? I want to read these words to you when Jesus perceived to become thoroughly acquainted with, to know thoroughly, to know accurately, and to know well. First of all, I want to say this. First of all, God knows everything you think. This morning, God, if you're a Christian, He lives in you. He knows exactly what you're thinking this moment. Boy, pastor's boring this morning. Isn't he done yet? And thank God we don't know what each other are thinking. Amen? The Bible teaches that he knows every one of our thoughts. 
you know what's the amazing thing is? Not that he knows our thoughts, but that he still loves us. I want to read a couple of scriptures and I want to say this to you. Psalm 139, verse 2. Thou knows my down sittings and my uprisings. Thou understand my thoughts afar off. Matthew 12, 25. And Jesus knew their thoughts and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to this desolation and every city of house divided against itself shall not stand. And Revelation 2, 23. And I will kill her children and with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts and I will give unto one each according to his works. It's not a sin to have bad thoughts, beloved. It can lead you to sin if you allow those thoughts to consume you. It will lead you to sin if you allow those thoughts to, confer, to consume you. But the Bible teaches that we all have a river, and that's our mind. That river has all kinds of logs in there. And some of them are good thoughts, but the majority of them are bad thoughts. And what you do with those thoughts is going to govern your life. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to get those logs stopped and clogged. Or you're thinking on them and thinking on them and thinking on them, you just let them go through a river. And if you know that everyone has a river like that, those thoughts are bad, then you can be okay with it. The Bible teaches in the book of 2 Corinthians to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And that's what we have to do. If not, we're going to act on it in time. He asks them, why are you reasoning in your heart? In other words, why are you thinking and trying to resolve this in your own thinking? We must be careful of our reasoning, beloved. Concerning God, for we can reason ourselves right out of the truth. I want you to I want to say that to you again. We need to be careful of our reasoning. Concerning God, for we can reason ourselves right out of the truth. It is easy to do this, even as a Christian, to reason why we do something or we don't do something, even though we know the Word of God tells us to do it or not do it. Verse 23, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say up, rise, get up and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up his bed that he was lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. So I want to end this with this thought. This reminds us that only God can solve our sin problem. And every one of us have that problem. We can't even forgive ourselves because we don't have the power and the authority to forgive ourselves. We must be persuaded that God has truly and rightly forgiven us in the light of what Jesus did at the cross. Beloved, we need to every day come to God and ask God to forgive us our sins every day. Don't wait. Deal with sin right away before guilt can set in. I can't tell you the importance of removing guilt. And Jesus Christ has come to remove the guilt of sin. Guilt is one of the greatest tools the enemy uses to strengthen your growth and to keep you in bondage to yesterday's failures. It is a tool to keep you in his web. We have the guilt remover or the stain remover. His name is Jesus. Again, I want to read a scripture to you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. That's the word that I want to emphasize. The removal of guilt and the condemnation of sin and from all unrighteousness. 
This means that we can be washed from the penalty and the guilt of our sin. All we have to do is confess it and repent. Psychiatrist Dr. Carl Menninger, in his book, Whatever Became of Sin, writes this. He begins in his first chapter with an intriguing illustration. On a sunny day in September, a stern-faced, plainly dressed man could be seen standing still on a street corner in the busy Chicago Loop. As pe pedestrians t hurried on their way to lunch or business, he would solemnly lift up his arm and point his finger at the person nearest him, shout the single word, guilty! Notes Meninger, then without any change of expression, he would resume his stiff stance for a few moments before repeating the gesture. Then again, he would raise his arm and point and solemnly pronounce the word guilty to the passerby. The effects of this strange performance on the passing strangers was extraordinary, almost eerie. They would stare at him, hesitate, look away, look at each other, and then at him again, then hurriedly continue on their way. One man, turning to another, exclaimed, but how did he know? No doubt many others had similar thoughts. How did he know indeed? Guilty. Everyone guilty. Guilty of what? Guilty of overparking. Guilty of lying. Guilty of unfaithfulness to a wife. Guilty of evil thoughts or evil plans. Became of sin. The Bible teaches that God wants to remove the guilt. That is what God wants. Jesus came to forgive sins for every single sin. But he's also come to remove the guilt that sin has brought. Let's bow our hearts this morning, please. I want to emphasize this because I believe that God has laid this on my heart, this thing called guilt. Maybe there's something, first of all, you need to confess to God. God makes a promise. There's nothing that you confess. The word confess means to admit that God cannot cleanse you and wash you from. As a Christian, God will forgive anything you've done. Or maybe you just confess it, but the guilt's still there. Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches, can wash away the guilt of sin. God no longer wants you to be either controlled or condemned or walk in guilt. He wants you to walk in freedom as one of his children. You know, one of my children or my grandchildren would ever say, if they were to say, I'm sorry, you know, and what my grandson has this week, he didn't do anything big, he did something very small. And when he said, I'm sorry, Papa said, I don't care. <laughs> That's what I say to him. And there's nothing between us anymore. He doesn't feel guilty. And God says the same thing to you this morning. Is there something you five years ago or six years ago or a month ago or I don't know when it was. You and God do. He knows your thoughts, remember. Then ask him to forgive you and ask him to cleanse you from the guilt of any kind of sin, any kind of failure. Father, Jesus came to forgive us our sins. All you ask is confession. And we've all fallen short. We've all missed the mark. So this morning, we ask that you would forgive us, Lord. But Father, we ask for more than that this morning. We ask a removal of guilt, Lord God. And Father, there's nothing that you will not forgive. You promise us, Lord, as Christians, as your children. So wash every heart, Lord. Cleanse every heart, Lord God. And God, may they experience the freedom that true forgiveness and removal of guilt brings, Lord God. And Father, we want to thank you for loving us the way that you do. We want to thank you, Father, for knowing our need and filling our need, Lord God. 
Thank you for the life you've given us through Christ, Lord God. Unbelievable, Lord, the life you've given us. Now bless your people, Lord God, like only you can, Lord. And we thank you again, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. This morning we have the blessing of partaking of the Lord's Supper. It is a wonderful time and we can remember what it costs God for our forgiveness. The time to remember of the great love that God has for us through his Son. The Bible teaches, I'll wait one second till the kids are sat, sat down. The Bible teaches that we partake of the Lord's Supper to remember what it costs God. To remember what Jesus did. When you partake of the bread, you partake of the body that was broken for you. The hands that were pierced, the side that was pierced, the feet that were pierced. When you partake of the juice, you remember the blood that was shed for the remission or removal of sin, removal of condemnation and guilt. The Bible says that before they partook, took of the Lord's Supper, that they were to examine themselves to see if there be anything. And we did somewhat examine ourselves. But let's bow our hearts and let's see if there be anything that God desires or puts in our heart that he wants to cleanse us and wash us from. Father David said to you, search me, Lord, and know and see if there be anything between you and us, Lord God. For David knew he had blind spots, Lord God, just like we know. We can't see things, Lord God, unless you reveal them. So this morning, Lord God, please search us, Lord God. And Father, we confess and we receive your forgiveness. Now bring our hearts to repentance, Lord God, a turning 180 degrees toward you, Lord God. And Father, thank you. Again, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for solving our sin problem, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Elisha's come forward, please. Father, we ask for your blessing upon this cup and upon this bread. This morning we do remember, Lord, what it cost you, but we remember the great love of why you sent your son too, Lord. And today we forgive. We, we forgive others also as you have forgiven us, Lord God. Now bless all who partake and bless this, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me take eat same manner he took the cup took the sub saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me take drink let us stand this morning we're glad that you were here this morning I hope God blessed you today we have men and women up here. If you need prayer, we would love to pray for you. If you have kind of some kind of need, if you're sick, we'll anoint you with oil, whatever you desire. If you want to come up to the altar and kneel and pray, I suggest you do. It's a wonderful time. They'll be worship, doing some worship songs. Please join them. May God richly bless you today. As you look to him, may your eyes be set on him and him alone. God bless you and have a wonderful day. Worship you.